I was at Disneyland at a conference, and the news came on. The San Francisco quake had hit. Bay Bridge had collapsed. There were uh, untold numbers of injured and damages uh, into the millions. And I was far away and insulated and isolated. And while I lived in the valley and would have felt tremors in the valley, being in Disneyland kept me even further from the reality. I think it was 1990, but I wouldn't swear to that. It might have been late 1989. Thank you. See? It's wonderful to have such resource in the congregation. But this weekend, apparently, our resident historian, Eric Thornburg, informs me, is the 21st anniversary of the Northridge quake. Let's just take a quick survey and see how many of you were living in around or close enough to the Northridge quake to feel that one. Almost everyone. I am guessing, I know my, my friends the Hiddles actually live in Northridge, I'm guessing that this is not an event that you will soon forget. How many of you have already forgotten it? No, no. not an event you're going to forget. There is something so unsettling when terra firma, as we call it, is not terra firma. There's something deeply, deeply wrong with life as we know it when the very ground beneath us gives way and shakes. There's something really, truly, uh, how do I want to, uh, apocalyptically terrifying about the idea of the earth splitting and opening up. Hollywood does the best version of these things, of course. Um, you know, thousand-foot tidal waves, frozen universes, uh, great chasms opening into the heart of the earth where you can see the lava boiling at the center of the earth. All this wonderful special effect, and it makes for great entertainment. But if you've ever been in a house where the chandelier started doing this, or if you've ever watched a dish vibrate off of a shelf and fall and break, or if you've ever crawled to the foot of your bed and wondered if you would be crushed by your bed for having gotten out of it as the earth shook, you know what terror immediately strikes in your heart. I live in Glendale, and the coyotes start yelling whenever there's a tremor. I don't know what it was like up here, but you can just start hearing the animals howling and responding when there's something going on out there, even they know immediately something is wrong with the world. And we feel it in our hearts. I can, I can be laying in, and they always happen at night. Barbara and I were talking about this earlier. You never get an earthquake at like, I don't know, lunch hour when you're just out on a patio having a sandwich and, oh, that's interesting. I better hold on to my water cup here. It's always the middle of the night. And you wake up at, I don't know, 12, 1, 2, 3, and your heart is just pounding in your chest. And the whole thing has just been moving, and you wonder, is your house going to stay intact, or is it going to come apart? Any of you had those feelings, experiences? And then you're traumatized, right? So the next little one that comes along, it's really no big deal. 14 seconds and just a little bit of a shaker but you're practically ready to go, you know, to fall apart over that because of what you've been through already. We don't like it when our world is shaken. We don't like it when our world moves in this way. And interestingly enough, we don't like it when our world is shaken or shattered in our personal lives, metaphorically speaking, either something deeply unsettling about that. And so today, as we think about what it is that we as people just go through as part of life, tragic sometimes, painful sometimes, difficult sometimes, challenging enormously, utterly destructive sometimes, what we go through in life sometimes makes us and sometimes breaks us. I've always heard Christians say to one another, oh, 
I'm sorry you're going through this, but it's just going to make you stronger. <laughs> I'm not here to belittle the conviction of that statement. I am here to suggest that sometimes it crushes us and breaks us. And what I hope that we can develop in our year with God is the kind of faith that will withstand a shaking. Now, this may not work as a metaphor completely, but the alternatives aren't good, okay? Because when you leave earthquake country, you end up in snow country. I have never broken my tailbone in an earthquake yet, but it would be pretty easy to do in a sidewalk in North Dakota in the wintertime, I'm thinking. And when you leave earthquake country, you go to typhoon and tornado and hurricane country. Now, you're in bad shape if you're living in a place that has all of those things. <laughs> Strongly urge you to consider maybe moving. But we're in Southern California, and we don't have to deal with that. I mean, think about the people in Mississippi. They will never move here because they are afraid of earthquakes. But we get one of those things, what? Big one every 20, 25, 30, 40 years. They've got... 20 names of things coming through every season. <laughs> They've got Typhoon Paul and Hurricane this and, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is, um, Tornado Gladys and Ethel and, uh, you know. And these things are carving 100-foot swaths through their cornfields and taking their barns and moving them from Mississippi to Arkansas. So I, I think that, that, you know, the alternatives to going through the shaking, spiritually speaking as well as literally, aren't good. And yet I, I hope that we can develop a kind of personal strength and connection with God that enables us perhaps to endure some of these things. Now I'm going to weave back and forth between a couple of different ideas that to me are related and connected but may actually be very different in your mind. Forgive me for that, but bear with me. Because I think that we could talk about the idea of fear and trembling. Trembling is a kind of tremor or trembling. That could, that could have to do with something having to do with awe or wonder or respect. And while we might have that for an earthquake, that's not exactly a related concept. Um, we might be talking about a way of understanding our spiritual life as opposed to a physical reality. We may be thinking in apocalyptic terms when we read some of these texts and be looking forward to the physical signs that surround our understanding of what's going to happen when Jesus comes the second time. And it may be that some of the physical signs described by Jesus as symptoms of what he is going to, what we're going to experience before he comes may not just be physical but maybe spiritual as well. Um, and so we're just gonna, we're gonna live with a couple of these thoughts for a few minutes this morning together as we think about the year ahead of us and what it might mean to deepen our relationships with God in such a way that our connection allows us to withstand the shaking so that our house, spiritually speaking, doesn't come off its foundations so that we're not able to not live there anymore. Because you're, you're way ahead of the... I, gotta, I, I always appreciate you so much because you're so ahead of the curve as a group. You immediately understood earlier that the idea of what, you know, going through some of these things just makes you stronger. You immediately understood that while that can be the case, it's not necessarily the case. You've seen the human carnage along life's path. You've seen people who've given up faith. You've seen people who've given up God. You've seen people who've given up any hope in life. And you've seen people who've given up life itself through the shaking, through the challenges that they've faced. And those hard realities are part of our, part of our collective existence, part of our collective um, understanding and, and even part of our collective sadness, if you will. We know that our lives as we live them here aren't perfect. We know that we deal with some really, really ugly and difficult stuff. 
And how is it that we as Christians, people who maintain a faith in a God that we believe is powerful and strong and good and able to protect and willing to... And we've seen this in instances in our lives, and then it feels like it's not there. It feels like God has just taken a vacation. It feels like, why would something that you know we think he could have or should have prevented now happens in our lives, leaving us so bereft or so devastated or damaged. And where is God in all of that? And I just uh, I, I want to just pause. And uh, as we look at the text, let's just ask God to kind of enlighten us and strengthen us in this time. Pray with me. Lord, as we open your word this this morning, especially with this very difficult and Uh, challenging sort of idea of of what it means to go through really, truly devastating and difficult experiences and still somehow hold on to you. Please enlighten us this morning and open our eyes to the ways in which you will hold on to us. For we love you and we want to be closer to you, especially as we think about what it might mean to have a better version of ourselves individually and corporately as we go through this year. Thank you. Amen. (laughs) Debbie read our call to worship this morning in Psalm 46. I would invite you to to turn there. We're going to spend a little time in this together. I'm not going to do a line-by-line sort of homily and commentary on this, but I do want to point out a few things that poetically speak to our situation. Psalm 46. The first thing I want to point out to you is the refrain, okay? It is, a, it is a poem. It's in poetic, poetic form. Could be a song. I don't know the melody if it was sung. But we start in verse 1 with God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And then if you go down to verse 7, you get part of the chorus, a variation on a theme. This is kind of chorus A prime, if you will. The Lord Almighty is with us, The God of Jacob is our fortress, and then that line is repeated as a stanza again in verse 11. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Do you see that repeat, that sort of theme, the A and then A prime, A prime coming again? All right. So the the thesis of this poem, if you will, the, the main point of this is that God is with us. He's our fortress, our refuge, our strength. What is a refuge? That's not a word we use very often. What is a refuge? A safe place, a a shelter, a sanctuary, a security, a hiding place. All of those are apt descriptions of refuge. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble as the King James says, are in trouble. Now, what does ever-present mean? Now, is this just poetry, or do we think there's something theologically true about this statement? Just curious. I'm I'm not playing with you. Talk to me. I want to know. What do you think? You think there's truth to this. It's a theological statement as opposed to just a, a poetic alliteration or something. Okay, so what we have to conclude then, intellectually, because we're not going to be able to necessarily feel this emotionally, you see, the, the, there's a difference, is that if we believe theologically that God is ever-present, then we have to believe that God is with us even when we don't believe that he is. We have to believe that God is present to our crisis even when we don't see him intervening. 
God is present in our crisis even when we don't see his hand at work. In order for this statement to be true, everything I've just said has to also be true. His presence can't depend on your ability to see his workings. His presence can't depend on your emotional response to what's happening around you. His presence can't be dependent on your declaration of whether he's there or not. But does that follow logically? Or are you now all, I'm not so sure about that, Pastor. Therefore, we will not fear. Somehow that doesn't work for me. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work for most of you. And so I might have some growing to do. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. What does that sound like to you? Earthquake. A pretty good one. Now we're talking about one that is not just one of these cute little 6.2s or charming 7.1s. Now we're talking about something that might be a 13. All right, it's taking a mountain and throwing it into the depths of the sea. Now we're talking about something that's not going to produce a charming little 100-foot uh, tsunami. Now we're talking about something that isn't going to go into the villages of the edge of the sea at Thailand. It's going to go all over Thailand. Okay. So the psalmist has never experienced this kind of earthquake. This is... This is something he's talking about. He's never seen this kind of devastation, literally. So he's also perhaps talking to us spiritually, isn't he? Is that possible as we read this as poetry? I see some of you nodding. You know the nature of poetry is that sometimes it can use a real physical thing to be descriptive of something that's not physical. That's something metaphorical in our lives, something we we can allegorize or or speak of in metaphor. The sea now we're speaking of in verse 3. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. That's a lot of, of energy. I had the privilege of driving uh, very early in the morning uh, up to Big Sur in December. Some of you know I'm in a, a graduate program and I was going to take an interview uh, up in that area with a director of a preschool and on the way up, I noted I had never seen waves this big in the Pacific on that particular coast before. They were gigantic. And you should have seen the white caps and the way in which the rocks produce spray. It was absolutely spectacular and totally frightening. I thought I would not want to be out there for anything. And the person I was with is an avid surfer, and he didn't want to be out there for anything. Amazing surf. You watch the power of this water. And if you've ever been in even a three-foot swell, you know that it just kind of moves you. You, you, don't, you don't move water, it moves you. There's this tremendous power of the sea. And so the, the psalmist is not describing something trite here. This is something really big and powerful, something really scary that's happening. And then he turns to a scene of utter peace. There is a river, water again, but not the sea, whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells, God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fail. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but very quickly, it's very likely David is speaking of Jerusalem or Zion. And he probably is thinking literally. But we know that Zion, Jerusalem, could fall and be captured. We know that it was a physical city, so it's also a reference to Zion, the city of God, which John the Revelator speaks of. Out of that city, within that city, there's a river of life that flows from the throne of God. And so you see this, this beautiful contrast, a city that cannot fall, a city that is the capital city of God, a city that will not quake, whose waters don't threaten it, but bring it joy and life and peace. I like this phrase, he lifts his voice and the earth melts. 
You know, I, I, I don't know about you, I have seen a parent, mine, my parents, so angry that I thought that he was going to melt. <laughs> and I wondered if, in fact, uh, I might melt too as a, as a result of... So we have this, this, this energy coming from God in his voice. As he raises his voice, it just causes the earth to melt. That's his power. God Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob now there, we come to seven, is our fortress. That's our refrain. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the world. The wars cease to the end, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and turns, burns the shields with fire. God desolates and he makes peace. And then it just says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God Almighty is with us. Perhaps the first clue we get to this place where we can, we can survive the shaking and the tumult of the waters and the destruction around us is this phrase, be still and know that I am God. We think of it as a place of powerlessness but it's a place of tremendous power. We think of stillness as inactivity, and it's a place of tremendous discipline. We think of stillness, and we want to move. Sometimes when the shaking comes, we, like Job, must sit at the fire in silence and scrape our boils with the potsherds. Sometimes we, like Job, need to listen to our friends tell us all sorts of things, horrible things, and we need to know our God. This passage invites us in the midst of all of the things that are happening around us, earthquake, surging seas, mountains falling into the seas, desolation, warfare that's ended. In the midst of all of these things that are happening, this passage invites us not to meet war with war or to be stronger than the quake or to presume that we could shape the voice of God that when raised melts the elements. It invites us simply to be still and know He is God. Maybe that's an admission of powerlessness. Maybe that's a statement about dependence. Maybe that's a quiet space where God enters and gives us the kind of peace that flows in this river, this stream, that makes glad the city of God. <laughs> this brings us to Kings. Elijah, the great prophet, he's battled the priests of Baal on Carmel, He's done his work, and he's run. He went to a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing? And Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for you, God. The Israelites, they've rejected you. They've torn down your altars. They've put all the prophets to death. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Don't you love Elijah at this moment? I could not love him more. Not only is he tired and exasperated, but he's talking to God like he's tired and exasperated. And he's not even telling the truth. I love that God can totally handle that. You don't hear God saying to Elijah, you're a liar, get your facts straight. You don't hear God saying to him, what's the matter with you? I just delivered the priests of Baal to you. What, what's wrong with you? I just burned up your offering, the wood on the altar, the stones of the altar, the water around the altar. What is wrong with you, Elijah? 
Elijah's seen God act in this great way, and then he's tired, and he's running, and he's hungry. He's been ministered to, but he's still, he's, and he doesn't see God in any of this. Now, that's a different kind of shaking, isn't it? You've just done something great for God, or you've just had this incredible experience of God. Your faith is bolstered. You're high. You're excited by what you've seen, and boom, it all falls out from under you. The high is gone. Where is God now? Listen, Lord, what is this worth anyway? Yeah, I was on Carmel. Yes, we did. Well done. But I'm the only one. What's it worth to you? I'm the only one. Boy, have you ever felt like that? Oh, come on. Well, you haven't been to a Southern California Conference pastor's meeting. That's all I've got to say. That is an experience where you feel like the only one. So God sets Elijah straight, so gently, so beautifully. Go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for I am about to pass by. Let's have a little chat. Here's the God whose voice melts the rocks, right? A great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Is that a pretty powerful wind? But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. That's from bad to worse. And the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there came fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And that's where God was. Now, it may be that this writing is something of a response to ancient Greek philosophy. <coughs> earth, earth, wind, and fire, the sort of Zeno elements, mm -hmm. the deity of the elements, the sort of these are the things that contribute to the creation of everything and so forth. It may be that there's a, a Yahwist statement in this about that. But it's really telling that out of all of these extraordinary things happening around Elijah, God is not in any of them. He's in the whisper. Let's turn in our, our, in our Bibles to 1 Kings 19 physically so that we can be sure. The Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he repeated his story. I have been zealous. I'm the only one left. Then the Lord said, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshu king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahaloha, to succeed you as prophet. And he goes on to say, in verse 18, I reserve 7,000 in all Israel, whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouth has not kissed him. Seven is this number of completeness and perfection. So it may have been seven literal, seven literal thousand people. But God is saying, I have maintained perfect numbers of thousands of people whose hearts are still mine. You're not alone. Don't fall for that. Don't think, Elijah, that you're alone in this spiritual journey, in this struggle. And just so you know that you're not alone, I'm going to appoint you to appoint kings who will tear down the altars of Baal and a prophet who will succeed you. I am God. And I am in this silence. 
Sometimes when we don't hear God speak, there's just silence. Maybe we need to enter that for a while. Maybe we need to feel that silence. Our New Testament passage in Philippians, Paul talks about Christ. And this is perhaps the most powerful point of all. The Lord of the universe made flesh come to dwell with us, who being in very nature God, now this is of essence God, doesn't consider that something to use to his advantage, but not only becomes a servant and takes on human form, created form, but he became obedient even to death, as we all must, even to death on a cross. So God exalted him and placed everything in heaven and earth and under the earth under his name. And it says this, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. If we who take the name Christian are to take that name seriously, then the Christ who came and was not exempt from suffering and death, even a shameful death on the cross, was not exempt from torture and shame, was not exempt from alienation, and pain was not exempt from trial and tribulation and tempting and testing. Why should we as Christians consider that our lot should be any better? As it goes for the master, so it goes for the servant. Surely you have seen these shows on television, and they're often very unscholarly and badly done. That said, you know that when an ancient king was buried or queen was buried in many cultures, sometimes the queen, though living, would be killed and buried with the king, and sometimes servants were killed and buried with the king. To serve him in the afterlife. As it goes with the master, so it goes with the servants. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Is this about a lack of faith? Is this about our lack of conviction that God has saved and that we have salvation through Christ? By grace through faith? Is this, is this about an insecurity over that which is sure to us theologically? No. This is about the fact that we, by very nature of the one we follow, are subject to difficulty are subject to death, are subject to trauma and pain and tribulation and shaking. And as we journey through this, Christ had many opportunities to throw in the towel. But he didn't. Thank God. And he invites us not to throw in the towel either. So we get this encouragement, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not because God has not already accomplished it, but because you have the right to surrender it. You have the right to look at the difficult road and say, that is not the road for me. And I'm going to go, I think I saw Jordan a minute ago, there he is. I'm going to go back to a sermon I preached, I don't know, eight years ago on the Matrix. Any of you see the Matrix? Go see it. I think it's the best film made in forever. But anyway, there are some problems with it too, but I'm not going to digress into all of that. <laughs> there is an a, 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 a interesting sideline in the story. There's a person who, having been freed from the Matrix, who having been delivered and had his mind set free, it's a metaphor for salvation, for having experienced this, decides that he cannot live with the reality, that he doesn't want it anymore, and he wants to be plugged back into unreality. He wants to be plugged back into the matrix. He wants to go back to the world that isn't real because for him it is more real and more pleasurable 
and more desirable than the world that is. And he does so, and in doing so, he betrays a lot of people who've been freed. He's a sort of Judas figure in the film, if you will. I bring that up because we have all been freed from the matrix of sin. We've all been freed by Christ. We've all been freed indeed, the scripture says. But it's very tempting in trial and tribulation, in the difficulties of reality, to say, I don't want this anymore. It's very easy to turn from that and say, I want to get plugged back in. I want to live in unreality because it's more comfortable. It feels more secure, more familiar, more delightful than reality. For what it's worth. Finally, our gospel reading. Jesus is speaking apocalyptically here. We're looking at the signs of the end of the age. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. That's apocalyptic language. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming upon the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. I don't know what exactly this means, and I would probably be suspicious of any evangelist who could tell me they think they know exactly what it means, but I will give you this. What's being described is no less than cataclysmic. It's no less than terrifying. It's no less than destructive. And at the time in which we think there can be no hope for deliverance, Jesus says, at that time they will see the Son of Man, referring to himself, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Lift up your heads, the song says, your redemption draweth nigh. This isn't the course of our life day to day now or through the occasional great trauma that we might experience. This is our course up to the edge of eternity. This is our course up to the second coming of Jesus. The world around us will shake. Nothing will be sure, not even your footing. And God invites us to be still and know that he's God. To listen for the whisper of the still, small voice. To never count ourselves alone, he has saved for himself a people. To work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that is to say, great respect Mm -hmm. and awareness of what can take us away. And finally, he invites us to lift up our heads because at the time in which we are certain there can be no deliverance, and no salvation, that there can be no relief and no end to all of this, he appears. And not just now in a still small voice or in silence, but in glory and in power. And he delivers his own. May this story be our story as we journey this year and always with Christ as our Lord, our God, our Savior, our King. And may each of you be truly blessed, blessed with the capacity to survive any shaking that should come to your world or come to your way. Amen.